Tonight, the death toll passes 100 after a huge tornado hits Joplin, Missouri. Oh, it's getting big, big. Mowing down everything in its path, and the search continues for survivors. This is the CBS Evening News. Good evening from Joplin, Missouri tonight. Virtually everywhere you look in this city of 50,000, there is destruction. A massive tornado ripped through here about 6.30 last evening, less than half an hour after the warning sirens went off. As the search for victims goes on, the death toll is at least 116. The tornado's winds reach close to 200 miles an hour, destroying or damaging about 2,000 homes and businesses and carrying debris as far as 60 miles away. The Twister was the most destructive of 68 reported across seven Midwest states over the weekend. Some of the survivors in Joplin, in southwest Missouri, took refuge in a convenience store. Everybody get down, low on the ground. This cell phone video shows almost nothing, but tells us everything about what it's like when terror is on your doorstep. There are 18 or 19 people huddled inside this store. No electricity, no way of knowing just how bad it was about to get. People scream and pray and say what they fear could be their last words. I love everyone. I love everyone, man. I love you. Then it's finally over. I'm trying to. It was just over a month ago. We were in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, talking about the storm damage there, thinking we'd probably never seen anything quite like it before. Here in Joplin, it may even be worse. Block after block, mile after mile, as much as a quarter of this city of 50,000 looks like this. People out documenting the damage to their neighborhoods are stunned. This is a mere six, seven blocks away from our home, which is unimaginable. Daniel Powell and his wife made it, but... We have no transportation, we have no home. Destruction so total, there's little to do but sift for memories. Two things I want, her wedding ring and a, a, a leather satchel that she got me when we first got married that came with a leather Bible. And, in the front of it, it says, through everything, we will overcome. Ashley Haley's house was picked up and blown clear across the street. This is my neighbor's house. Where's your house? <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> she wasn't home, but her dog was, rescued from underneath the house, <laughs> of which there is nothing left. I mean, it breaks my heart, but I don't care as long as everyone's safe. I, that's all I care about. Not everyone was safe. Bodies are being found in cars, in debris, in wreckage like this, what was once an electrical substation. What's the biggest problem you have right now? Well, right now is it's, it's the weather we've got. Trying to do search and rescue uh, with the dogs and with the, the machines that are necessary uh, to have electronics with the lightning going on is very difficult. Yeah, we heard uh, some siren. Mark Reed and his wife found safety in their bathtub. And took what shelter we could and we wrote it out, thank God. You're lucky to be. Oh, we are very lucky. But right now, it's hard for his stepdaughter, Desiree, to feel lucky. It's my whole life just thrown about, and it's just gone. As bad as all of this looks on television, in person, it is much worse. Just moments ago, we talked with Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. How bad is this? The lethality of the storm is, is historic. When you have, you know, well over 100 people uh, dead uh, from a tornado like this, one, it didn't really move. It kind of screwed into the earth and just, just got worse and worse. Uh, hospital wiped out, nursing home, schools. Uh, this is a dramatic tragedy for our area, but we'll, we'll bounce back. But first of all, we need to make sure we get to cover the entire area. We, we discovered seven people today and rescued them. We think there's other live people out there. We want to make sure that if folks are underneath this rubble and alive, that we're out there finding them. This many people killed in this size of community, pretty much everybody here knows somebody who's a victim. 
Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. One of the hardest hit places here in Joplin is the big community hospital behind us. Cynthia Bowers is with us here and has more on that. Cynthia? You know, that's right, Harry. It's safe to say nobody expected this. After all, St. John's did withstand the power of a tornado just as recently as 2008. Typically, this building plays a key role in treating the injured, but not this time. Even in the midst of miles of rubble, St. John's Regional Medical Center stands out. And not just because it's still standing. With virtually every window shattered, the top two floors taken out, it looks like a bomb went off inside. How horrifying was it when it actually hit? It was very. Our doors and windows were blowing in on us before we could even take cover. ER nurse Angie Abner had 20 minutes to race patients and visitors into the hospital's interior hallways in search of safety before the enormous twister tore St. John's apart. Things were flying over our heads and it just sounding like a bomb. Doors were flying off, medical equipment flying over our heads. Very scary. Looking at this storm, it is amazing 180 patients made it out alive. In the panicked moments after the twister, the most critical patients were rushed to a nearby hospital in ambulances, pickups, and even carried on makeshift stretchers. Others went to triage tents set up close by. St. John's officials were forced to turn this auditorium into a makeshift hospital, a battlefield hospital. For all intents and purposes, this is St. John's now and will be for a while. We were totally deaf, dumb, and blind. Uh, we couldn't reach the police. We couldn't reach um, EMS. Dr. Jim Risco has worked in the ER at St. John's for 30 years. Now he's tending the sick at Memorial Hall with dozens of his colleagues. All my staff is, is here. I mean, I had. Um, two pregnant nurses that dove under gurneys, and I mean, I was just was so worried that, that they were they were hurt, but you know, they showed up and they they worked all night long. So it's a testimony to human spirit. It must make you feel proud. Very proud. More than a thousand people have been treated here in Joplin so far for the tornado injuries, but there is no way, Harry, of course, to calculate the pain. Cynthia Bowers, thank you so much. As we've been talking since we went on the air tonight, it's hard to get a handle on just the scope of this. It's not block after block, it's mile after mile in Joplin. Across town from us is colleague Don Teague. In the 2500 block of Murphy Street, everything that once was is gone. Are you just putting these in the truck, Mom? For Rhonda Hall, that means the house she grew up in, where her father still lived until last night, is now just a pile of broken wood and memories. I grew up in this house. Um, my dad grew up in this house. Um, and to think it's all gone, and, and where do you go from there, you know? Hill and her children are trying to salvage what they can, but it's not much. He just had $50,000 worth of insurance. So, he, you know, whatever we can salvage, we need to do. There's simply nothing recognizable left on the 2500 block of Murphy Street. Even the road sign is gone. But this isn't the only street in Joplin that looks like this. Across this city, there are dozens, perhaps even hundreds, just like this. Neighbors here think the people on this street survived, even if their homes didn't. Adam Hampton just moved into his house here last summer. Used to be a real pretty neighborhood. He survived because he stopped at his mother's house on the way home from church Sunday. He credits God with saving his life. Now he's picking up what's left. Being in the Midwest here, we're, you know, we're pretty resilient people. We will bounce back from this. It'll take us some time, but uh, I think we will. We'll band together and, and we'll get, get it rebuilt in time. As for Rhonda Hill's father, uh, he was asleep on his sofa when the tornado destroyed his home around him, but miraculously, he survived with only minor injuries. Meanwhile, it's been dangerous here today, Harry, for residents who've been out with terrible lightning and more severe th storms as they're trying to pick through what's left of their homes. Harry? Don Teague across town from us in Joplin tonight. Thank you very much. And as Harry mentioned, there were dozens of tornadoes throughout the Midwest last evening. This one was captured on amateur video as it tore through North Minneapolis. On block after block, roofs were ripped off and tree limbs went flying. One man reportedly died when a tree fell in his car. Another died of a heart attack after cleaning debris. This tornado season is now the deadliest in more than a half century. More on that from Anthony Mason.
At the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma last week. And this is actually a weather forecast, a storm's developing. Corey Mead, the lead forecaster. And upgrade that to a tornado. Was already tracking the early stages of the storm system that would devastate Joplin. We don't fully understand how tornadoes form. But Mead, a 17-year veteran of the National Weather Service, says forecasting has improved significantly. We actually can anticipate uh, the potential for those type of storms several days out, but uh, the exact uh, uh, location and, and timing of, of more significant tornado threats, sometimes we don't know up until perhaps a few hours leading up to the events. Through this date last year, 506 tornadoes were reported in the U.S. This year, that number is already more than double that, 1,151. This is just remarkable. Superstorms, says Professor Stan Gedzelman, are formed by an instability in the air that usually occurs in the spring. Yesterday's instability and the instability of the storms that hit Tuscaloosa is as large as, just about as large as I have ever seen. Gedzelman sees nothing strange in the weather pattern this year, but year to date, tornadoes have killed nearly 500 people. That's six times the annual average, making this the deadliest season in more than half a century. Did the warning system fail us? The warning system was absolutely as good as it could be. In fact, Joplin residents were given at least 20 minutes warning when studies have shown that warnings of just 6 to 15 minutes reduce expected fatalities by more than 40 percent. It's just that the level of destruction is, uh, is beyond belief. It's rare for tornadoes of this force to form at all. Rarer still for them to find population centers like Tuscaloosa and now Joplin. Anthony Mason, CBS News, New York. And here's what else is happening tonight. There is another natural disaster unfolding this evening. This one threatens air travel. Iceland's largest volcano is sending a giant cloud of ash into the sky. It is not the same volcano that caused chaos last year, but dozens of flights into and out of Great Britain have been canceled. The cloud is expected to reach Europe and spread through hundreds of miles of airspace. And with that ash bearing down on Europe, President Obama left Ireland a few hours early and flew to London this evening. But not before visiting Moneygall, the tiny village that was home to his great-great-great-grandfather on his mother's side. The president's visit included a trip to the local pub. Later in Dublin, his motorcade ran into some trouble, leaving the U.S. Embassy. One of the presidential limos, which the president was not in, bottomed out, as you saw right there, and got stuck causing a slight delay in Mr. Obama's travel plans. Up next on tonight's CBS Evening News, a bombshell in the Chicago terrorism trial was an American ally behind India's 9-11. And later, the Supreme Court says thousands of convicted criminals are free to go. A Chicago man is on trial for his alleged role in what's been called India's 9-11, the deadly terror attack on a hotel in Mumbai. Today, a star witness testified that Pakistan's intelligence service was involved. Justice correspondent Bob Orr has the story. In pleading guilty, Chicagoan David Headley confessed to scouting targets for the 2008 Mumbai attacks, which killed more than 160 people, including six Americans. The attacks were planned and carried out by the Pakistan-based terror group lashkar e taiba But today in court, Headley testified publicly for the first time that Lashkar had support from the Pakistan Intelligence Services, the ISI. Quote, they coordinated with each other. Headley said under oath, ISI provided assistance to Lashkar. He provided no other immediate details. Headley was the lead-off prosecution witness against his former friend, Tahawar Rana. Rana, who ran a business aimed at helping immigrants, denies any involvement in the Mumbai plot. But prosecutors today countered that Rana not only knew of the attacks, he approved of them and agreed with them. The case, though, is much bigger than Rana. Headley's testimony, as it unfolds, threatens to further stress U.S.-Pakistan relations, especially if Headley provides the names of high-ranking Pakistani authorities with provable links to terrorists. You have a question as to whether or not the Pakistani government, the intelligence services, the military, were complicit in the run-up and the execution of the Mumbai attacks. Now, Headley's also had admitted dealings in the past with al-Qaeda, so he's likely going to be asked 
what he knows, if anything, about potential links between Pakistani officials and top terror leaders like Osama bin Laden. Russ? Bob Orr in Washington. Thank you very much. A U.S. Supreme Court decision today could unlock prison doors for tens of thousands of criminals in California. The court ruled that crowded conditions like these bunk beds and poor medical care violate inmates' rights. Chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford joins us now from Washington with more. Jan, good evening. Good evening, Russ. I mean, this case deeply divided the justices along ideological lines. It was a 5-4 decision written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, who joined the court's four liberals in saying the drastic remedy was necessary because the overcrowding was causing needless suffering and death. Kennedy wrote, a prison that deprives prisoners of basic sustenance, including adequate medical care, has no place in civilized society. Now, this case produced an extraordinarily heated debate between the conservative and liberal justices. In dissent, Justice Samuel Alito said the court was, quote, gambling with the safety of the people of California. He added, I fear that today's decision, like prior prisoner release orders, will lead to a grim roster of victims. Now, Justice Alito referenced a smaller release in Philadelphia back in the 1990s that resulted in thousands of rearrests and almost 10,000 new crimes. But Justice Kennedy downplayed that threat to the public. He said that was overblown. He suggested that the state of California could take up to five years to cut the prison population and could also decide, you know, which inmates that they were going to let go. But Kennedy acknowledged that even doing those things still would mean an unprecedented release of prisoners. Russ? You mentioned five years, Jan. Give me a timetable. How soon could these prisoners actually be on the street? Well, the court said that they can go back to the lower court and say, look, we need five years. So this does not mean the prisoners are going to be out on the street tomorrow. They may have some extra time to work something out. Okay. Jan Crawford in our D.C. Bureau. Thank you so much. When we come back, an arrest and the beating of a Giants fan at Dodger Stadium. But the manhunt isn't over. After a Giants fan was brutally beaten at Dodger Stadium on opening day, Los Angeles police checked out nearly 650 tips. But the big break in the investigation came from inside law enforcement. Now, as Bill Whitaker tells us, an ex-con with a violent past is behind bars. The most intense LAPD manhunt this year led the SWAT team to these Hollywood apartments Sunday and the arrest of Giovanni Ramirez, the 31-year-old parolee charged with assault with a deadly weapon in the savage beating of Giants fan Brian Stowe at the L.A. Dodgers opening game. Today, Stowe's family said though Brian remains in critical condition, severely brain damaged, they've never given up hope for his recovery or that his attackers would be found. So it was a very emotional day yesterday. We were very excited that that piece of the puzzle, one of the pieces, had been put in place. There are two more pieces to this puzzle outstanding, the second assailant and the woman who drove them from the scene. And we have a lot of information regarding this female. She was wearing a Dodger jersey, and we're actually following up on that angle. Police were led to Ramirez when his parole officer recognized him on the wanted poster. He has three prior felony charges for robbery and use of weapons, is a member of the Vario Nueva Estrada gang, one of the oldest and largest in Los Angeles. Members promote themselves on YouTube and boast of being proud Dodgers fans. You know Since Stowe's attack, the Dodgers have taken a beating too, attendance down 16% this year. Meanwhile, police say tips about the remaining two suspects now are pouring in. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Los Angeles. For two years, it has been a mystery what caused an Air France jetliner to crash off the coast of South America, killing 228 people. Well, tonight, the Wall Street Journal is quoting investigators as saying pilot error was a major factor. They say recording devices recently recovered from the Airbus A330 show the pilots were distracted and confused by faulty airspeed indicators as the plane flew through turbulence. And as the investigators say, the pilots failed to follow standard procedures to keep the plane's nose level. A word now about a member of our CBS News family, Tom McEnany. He was one of the finest video editors in the business. Many of you saw his work in last night's 60-minute story about Lance Armstrong. Tom died suddenly after finishing that piece. He was just 57 years old. Tom was a mentor to many young editors and producers, a heck of a nice guy, and a friend to all of us. Our thoughts are with his wife, Susan, and sons, Thomas and Brian. 
I'm Russ Mitchell in New York. Harry Smith in Joplin, Missouri, will have an update on that bad weather there in just a moment. Back now with more from Joplin, Missouri, as the search for survivors continues in an area that has been plagued by thunder and lightning all day, making that job doubly difficult. At least 116 people were killed by the twister, which was packing winds of nearly 200 miles an hour. About 2,000 homes and businesses were damaged or destroyed. St. John's Regional Medical Center got a direct hit. At least five people were killed there. Getting around is extremely difficult tonight. The streets are blocked by downed trees, debris, and emergency vehicles. For Russ Mitchell in New York, I'm Harry Smith in Joplin. That's the CBS Evening News for tonight. Good night. What if you could have the integrity, the experience, the original reporting of 60 Minutes every weeknight? Well, now you can. The CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley begins June 6th.